Oh, gracious Lord God, I pray that you would put power on this message, because I know that it will mean nothing to no one if, it, if you're not in it, Lord, if you're not in the midst. And I would just ask that our worship today would be pleasing to you, Lord. Um, these words would be your words and not mine. And this I want to ask in the name of thy dear Son, Jesus. Amen. Well, here we find ourselves in the first Sunday in Lent. This is truly uh, my probably favorite season of the entire church year. There is so much meaning. There's so much to be gleaned from this. And um, while I was preparing for my message today, I found a fascinating story that, that's a true story that I uh, really wanted to share with you. It was told by a pastor, Leith Anderson, he told the story of his acquaintance, David, who was ahead of him in graduate school. He says, we overlapped for only a semester, so I didn't get to know him as well as I wish I had. He became a pastor in Northern California, not far from Santa Cruz. He said, he contracted terminal cancer, and which led to a protracted and painful death, leaving a young wife and children behind. I think we can all empathize with that. It's right to the heart. He said, during the final year of his struggle, though, he reported an appearance and conversation with Satan. The way he told it, the devil offered him a deal, life and health for his soul. If he would pledge allegiance to Satan, he could live a long, healthy life. If not, he would die a soon and miserable death. David said this, he said, it was not an easy decision. He wanted to live, but he chose to decline the offer, and he died. Now I ask you today a straightforward question. What would you do if you were faced with such a difficult test? The truth is, if we're to admit it, we're all faced with uh, life's uh, temptations and tests. Life is just loaded with them. More during some chapters of our lives and less during others, but they never, ever completely go away. We can't expect them to. This is the first truth, and there is another, and that is to be tempted. I want us to be clear about this today. To be tempted is not a sin. If temptation were a sin, then we'd have to say that Jesus himself is a sinner. Simply being tempted isn't the equivalent of participating in evil. I believe okay, that Jesus wanted to make this very clear to his followers, which is why that he would have been related. If you think about who's the source in the story, it had to be Jesus himself. And he relays uh, the whole story of blow by blow um, for us. He's the source. So if it's true, okay, we learn that, number one, this is number one on the outline, God can use even the wicked for good. God can use even the wicked for good. Now, this whole business of temptation often, though, causes people to wonder, is God somehow culpable in the temptation process? Does God have a role, some would ask, either in directly causing us to be tempted or in Allowing this to happen? Recall, though, in the book of James, if you're familiar with that book, it, this is what it says in James 1, Let no one say when he's tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Yet, there's another event in Scripture. If you're familiar with Scripture, go way back to Abraham. He is tested by God to take his son Isaac, remember that, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice. So, what does all this mean? Well, we can shed some light on uh, <clears throat> understanding these passages when we understand that there are two words in Greek for the word test. One word is to emphasize a test with a view toward uh, approval. Okay, or strengthening. The second use of the word test is with a view toward destruction and failure. While God may test us, <clears throat> we can say this, Scripture says all over Scripture, He does it uh, with a view toward strengthening us and never for our own failure. 
Satan, of course, just the opposite. He'll test us with the intent of leading us toward all harm and destruction. As a matter of fact, as much of it as he can wreak in our lives, he'll take. And Satan doesn't waste any time. I see this this temptation event in the wilderness with great irony. It occurs just after we're told Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit. So what about it? Am I saying that God orchestrated somehow this temptation of Jesus under the guidance of the Holy Spirit? Yes. I'm actually saying that. For God knew Jesus would be able to come through it and would strengthen him and ultimately all of us who would come after Jesus seeking to follow in his footsteps. Now, Jesus spent almost six weeks without food in the Judean wilderness. Know this about this wilderness. It's roughly a 425 square mile desert between the Dead Sea and Jerusalem. To this day, it is mostly uninhabited. So if you make a trip to the Holy Land, this is what you would discover. A desolate place with large hills, deep ravines, dry, crusty soil, minimal vegetation, and dangers galore. Luke 4, 1 to 13 tells us about what happened there. It's a very private story, and as we said, Jesus himself would have to be the one to have revealed this. Otherwise, none of us would have ever known. Satan appears to Jesus and repeatedly tested him with a series of temptations. We know the details of at least three of these temptations. There probably were many more in Jesus' life. Uh, In every test, the devil was trying to get Jesus to doubt and deny that he was actually the Son of God. He kept telling Jesus, if you are the Son of God, do this or do that. Satan's evil strategies were simple, but they were extremely clever. Extremely clever. So Jesus is faced with, it brings me to my second point on your outline, the first temptation which can be summarized as one of self-satisfaction. The first temptation, one of self-satisfaction. Satan said, if you're the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. It was a temptation for Jesus to take care of himself. And who wouldn't do this? He was hungry. This is proof positive of his humanity. It's a sign Jesus truly was fully human. He hadn't eaten for more than a month. Bread sounded good, and he needed it. The temptation was carefully crafted to reflect Jesus' needs at the moment. If he'd been thirsty, there probably would have been something with water, that some kind of temptation to quench his thirst. Like many temptations, there's a difference between the surface and then what lies underneath. On the surface, it sounded like a simple suggestion for Jesus to use his supernatural powers to turn a limestone rock into a similar-sized loaf of bread to eat. Ha, but friends, it was much more than that. Jesus had supernatural powers, which Satan wanted him to use for himself rather than for others. Or perhaps it was tempting, he was tempting Jesus to use his powers to feed the world so all people would be drawn to him by this provision. If you think about it, he essentially wanted Jesus to become materialistic, to use resources like magic to provide for others and himself wherever and whenever he wanted it. So Satan tempted Jesus to say his physical needs were far more important than his spiritual needs. Now, none of us, of course, faces that same temptation. To my knowledge, There isn't a one of us that would be able to turn a stone into bread or anything else, for that matter. Only Jesus had that supernatural ability. But we're all tempted to use resources for ourselves, are we not? In fact, we often convince ourselves that we'll be satisfied, we'll be happy when we finally obtain what we want. Unlike much of the world, we don't have to worry about food. Or shelter, the basic things, uh, but may, we may long for larger houses, fancier cars, or some other possession. Why? Because we live in a materialistic society. We cannot, try as we might, we cannot escape it. It's easy to pursue this temptation with passion. 
Now, here's a few statistics um, that I found most revealing. Harper's Magazine, this goes all the way back to 1997, so it was quite a while ago, but it reported a survey of that 82% of Americans believe that most of us buy and consume more than we need. Okay? We know we already have more than we need, and yet we cannot resist the temptation to buy more, can we? I found that to be so true. For me, all right, I'm going to admit something to you here. It's shoes. You take me to a Nordstrom rack, and I am likely to come out with at least two, three, or four pairs of shoes, and I justify it by saying, well, I won't have to buy shoes for a while. A UN report says that the combined wealth of the world's 358 billionaires equals the total income of the world's 2.3 billion poorest people. So, 358 wealthy people have as much money as 45% of the world's population earns. Can you believe that? All right, so the second temptation, we move on to that. It becomes far more sweeping than the first. The devil takes Jesus up uh, on a mountain and offers him all the kingdoms of the world. So, the second temptation... Is, and this is point number three, the second temptation is a temptation to compromise. To compromise. Okay? Satan claimed that he owned the earth. That's largely a true statement. If you look up uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, what does Paul say? But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. We see this readily. The gospel is presented so clearly in so many churches week after week after week here in this country, yet men and women say, no, thank you. I can do without that. Satan has affected the lives of the majority of human beings who prefer to exist via means of their own self-sufficiency. Now, consider this for a moment. Jesus had an opportunity to answer the greatest human criticism of God. Almost, you know, since the creation of the human race, believers and unbelievers alike have always asked, if there really is a God, why is there so much evil and suffering in the world? The answer, of course, is that we rebelled. There is sin and there is Satan. And, they've done, and he's done untold evil and caused all kinds of pain here on earth. But that answer doesn't satisfy a lot of people when they're in misery. Here was Jesus' grand opportunity to make a difference for good. Satan offered Jesus the rule of the world. He could skip the cross and go directly to the throne of this world. He could immediately stop, perhaps, all of the injustice, eliminate poverty, outlaw sin, pain, and suffering. Do you see the depth of this temptation? It would be a wonderful and unselfish thing to do on the one hand. The only problem would be he would have to acknowledge the superiority of Satan. But with the trade-off, he could accomplish great good. Do the ends justify the means? Do you see the dilemma here? So here's the question, what would you do? If you could buy an end to all human suffering, secure universal cures for painful terminal illnesses, eliminate all child abuse, stop all government corruption, stop all wars and halt crime, would you do it for the price of worshiping Satan? Even though it was giving in to an awful evil, you could accomplish enormous good. I think any good person would be tempted to say yes. Must have been excruciating for Jesus. What did his decision mean? Well, Think about this for a moment. It meant that sin and suffering would continue until this old world came to an end. Although not politically correct, Jesus insisted there's only one right way. There's only one God, and there would be no compromise with evil, for it would eventually lead to destruction. So then we come to the final temptation. Number four, the final temptation is one of popularity. Here, Jesus is taken to the pinnacle of the temple and he's told to just jump off. His angels will rescue him. 
The place where Satan took Jesus was the portico of the temple, which extended high above the Kidron Valley. Between the height of the temple and the depth of the valley, do you know it was 450 feet? If Jesus had, you know, waited for a crowd to gather below, they could watch him magically fall, free fall, the 400 feet about, before being swept up by the angels. He could wow the crowd. Word would spread immediately, and he would be the center of attention, would he not? Popularity? Oh, goodness, that's a powerful thing. Don't we all want to be loved and accepted by others? In fact, this may well be the greatest human need of all. So think about it for a moment. If you could have a guaranteed stunt that would make you the most popular and sought-after person in America, would you do it? Wouldn't it be great to be more famous than any politician, musician, or professional athlete? Wouldn't it be fun to have an entire population swooning over you, trying to make you happy? Jesus was tempted, but he said no. And he quoted the scriptures as he did for the two other temptations. He responded by saying, do not put the Lord your God to the test. That's in Deuteronomy 6, 16. As a matter of fact, every time he quoted, he quoted from Deuteronomy. For by putting someone to the test, that is akin to expressing doubt in them. For example, you know, you don't run a DNA uh, paternity test to determine paternity unless there is doubt about who the Father is. Those who refuse to, to test God, well, who are they? They're the ones who are already convinced. God loves them and cares for them, is going to take care of them no matter what. They trust. Still others may say, God, if you really love me, give me that promotion I want. Make me popular with my friends. Those who trust in the Lord, though, they refuse to construct these kinds of tests. So, in conclusion, what's the takeaway? from these temptations of Jesus? Well, I can give you four real good ones, okay? I hope I have your attention here. What do we take away from this? First, we learn that the best answers to temptation come from the Bible. This isn't rocket science. Jesus demonstrated each time he was tempted that he knew the scriptures and he quoted from them as his strength. You want to know why I ask catechism students to memorize things? There you have it. I fear... Many of us couldn't easily do it. But the truth is, there is power in the Word. Secondly, we learn it's important to be full of, filled with the Holy Spirit. We're told that Jesus was filled and directed by the Holy Spirit and allowed Himself to be controlled by it. If you're not sure you're filled with the Holy Spirit, ask God. That should be the basis of your prayer. There's a third thing we learn from this, and that is to take the long-term view. The idea, uh, the fact that we're not just justified with what might be immediately before us, or satisfied, rather, with what appears immediately before us, but that we are thinking of life in the long term and the consequences. Immediate satisfaction isn't always the right answer. I think we all have probably learned that at one time or another. And then fourthly, we learn that it isn't always over when we think it's over. In Luke 4.13, we learn that the devil departs for what? A more opportune time. Meaning, of course, he will be back. We cannot afford to let down our guard. So, it would be well... If all of us take time to figure out what is our temptation, chances are you already know it. There is greed, there is sex, there's money, there's pride, there's popularity, and there's self-pity. I'm sure there's a lot more than that. Those are some biggies. We might also ask, if Satan wanted to destroy you, how would he be most likely to do it? What one would he play on? In answer... May we respond like Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, knowing Scripture, ready to resist evil when it rears its ugly head. Amen. Hello, I'm Pastor Kent Hollis. I hope this message was meaningful to you and touched your heart in some way. We encourage you to check out our website at sjlcmetro.com.
sjlcmetro.com. That's sjlcmetro.com. You can get further information regarding our ministry here at St. John Lutheran Church. And may the Lord bless you richly as you seek to be in relationship with him.